most Bible handbooks tell us that the book of 1 Samuel covers the reign of Israel's first king, King Saul, while 2 Samuel covers the reign of Israel's second king, David. And while that's chronologically correct, it misses an important point that I hope you've picked up over the last several weeks. Yes, it is true that David is crowned king in 2 Samuel, but in so many ways he becomes king in 1 Samuel. And David does not become king by sitting on a throne, a position. Rather, he becomes king by walking through trials, literal persecution. So here's what we learn from David's life. God places the character of a king in his heart long before he ever places the crown of a king on his head. Many Christians desire to be used by God in some way, but they don't understand something that's very important. They don't understand that there's a lifetime process of preparation to be used by God. God uses many different tests to prepare his servants. At the time, they seem like deep, dark, valley experiences. It's only when we look back at them in hindsight that we see those trials as some of the most precious times in our spiritual lives. So David's story is our story in many, many ways. Folks, before God ever promotes you to a higher level, to the next level, you will almost always find yourself walking in that higher level of anointing and authority, but without any position or any recognition of it at first. You receive a new anointing, and then God sends a series of challenging tests to beat the flesh out of you so that you don't explode with pride and arrogance when you finally do arrive at that next level of ministry. The transition always has to take place internally, before it ever manifests externally. That's why faithfulness is so important. The most important thing you know, need to know in your walk with God, the most important thing you need to know about your spiritual life is what is really inside you. And God's delays in your life reveal that to you better than just about anything else. Now, we serve a God with whom the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, One day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So with a God like that, it's not at all surprising that he would take a decade of David's life to prepare him for four decades on the throne of Israel. Like David, we have to learn that with our God, delay is not denial. Just because God says not now doesn't mean he's saying not ever And if you read your Bible, David and Daniel and Abraham and Moses, in fact, all of God's servants have to learn this very important lesson. Daniel writes it down this way in Daniel 10. He said, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. That's how God works. God speaks wonderful things, dreams. God God speaks uh, answers to prayer, and you can almost taste them and feel them, and you can almost see them long before they ever take place in the physical realm. And here's what you have to learn about God, that he doesn't tease and tantalize his people. If God put a dream in your heart, the thing is true, even though the time may be a little bit off from what you'd prefer. God sometimes takes longer than what we like. David's son Solomon would learn this principle only when he grew to be an old man, but David lived this principle even when he was a young man. Here's what Solomon would write years later in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 8. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. That was the critical difference between Saul and David. Saul was always proud in spirit, so he did things his own way and in his own timing. But David was always patient in spirit, so he waited for God's way and God's timing. 
At the beginning, it looks like Saul's way is easiest and fastest and best. After all, he's the guy that gets to sit on the throne. It's only at the end of Saul's life that the truth is finally seen and God's word is finally proved. Now, we covered this last time in chapter 29. The Philistine kings were unwilling to go to battle alongside David and his men. So they sent them home to Ziklag from the battlefield. You remember that from last time. It was a no-win situation. David was among the Philistines. He and his men were living among them. And if he had gone to battle that day, either he would have had to betray the Philistines who had been so kind to him, Or he would have had to betray his own people, Israel. If David and his men had fought that day, Israel would never have received him as their king. Never would have happened. David also didn't know know something very important. He didn't know that day that this was the battle in which Saul and his sons would be killed, including David's beloved friend, Jonathan. And so this is how God worked in David's life. He used a Philistine king to keep Israel's future king from being part of the army that killed Israel's present king. That's amazing. God literally used one of David's enemies to keep him from doing something that would have impacted his future in such a negative way. However, David and his men arrived back in Ziklag to find a terrible tragedy. While they've been away, The city has been smitten and burned with fire, and their wives and their children have been taken captive by the Amalekites. The Amalekites were one of the most enduring enemies of God's people in the Old Testament. They never missed an opportunity to attack Israel. They were ruthless and cruel and sadistic and barbaric and aggressive. One rabbinical source says that their name, Amalek, literally means people who lick blood. They were brutal. And their primary ambition was the total annihilation of God's people. And so the only recourse, according to God himself in 1 Samuel 15, the only recourse Israel had was to launch a preemptive strike and totally obliterate the Amalekites before they obliterated Israel. That's why God gave the order to King Saul to kill the Amalekites. And that's precisely why Saul's refusal to do so cost him his throne and eventually cost him his life. If Saul had only been willing to act on that day, the Amalekites would not have survived to attack David on this day. The Bible simply says that everything was burned with fire. They didn't kill anybody among David's wives and his men's wives and their children, but they carried them away captive. It's almost doubtless that they were either going to abuse them, torture them, kill them, or sell them into slavery. And so when David came, it was total devastation. Folks, this is the worst day of David's life, and it gets even worse. This debilitating attack is such a shock to the system that even David's men momentarily, these men that love him and have served him and have walked with him and they've been loyal to him through all the persecution of Saul, even those men speak of stoning their beloved leader, David. They've faced a severe emotional, spiritual trauma. They haven't just lost face, they've lost family. And nothing hits us harder than when the devil attacks our homes. The enemy has their children in his grip at this moment. And so the Bible says that David and all the people that were with him, they lifted up their voice and they wept until they had no more strength, no more power to weep. And the people spake of stoning David and his soul was greatly distressed. But there's just one little factor that the enemy never took into account. 
The Amalekites on this day haven't attacked a weak, waffling leader like Saul. They've made the mistake of attacking a very different kind of opponent. Instead of collapsing in despair, David keeps his spiritual wits about him and he goes to prayer and he encourages himself in the Lord. Saul needed the approval and the affirmation of everybody around him and that's why he's a weak leader. But David doesn't need anybody else's affirmation or approval. He only needs God's affirmation and approval. And that's why he's a strong leader. I got to tell you that there will be times in your spiritual life, if you serve Jesus more than five minutes, there are going to be times when nobody else can encourage you. Nobody else can help you. You're going to have to learn how to encourage yourself in the Lord. You're going to have to learn how to take it to God in prayer instead of just taking it to everybody else in talk. Because talk is cheap and talk can be pointless and talk can create more problems out of the problem you already have. But when you take it to the Lord and you encourage yourself in the Lord, that begins to turn everything around. Verse 7, David goes to Abiathar the priest and he said, bring the ephod, I want to seek the Lord. And David goes to talk to God. And he returns to his devastated men who are still crying and weeping and mourning and overcome. They don't even have any power to cry anymore. David says, I got a word from the Lord. I went and asked the Lord, shall I pursue after the Amalekites? And if I chase them, will I overtake them? And God answered me, guys. God said, you pursue because if you pursue, you will overtake. And when you overtake them, you will recover all. David, it's going to be God who gives you the victory, but unless you put forth a little effort of your own, there won't be any victory. This is how God works with us. I believe that God can do anything. I believe that God fights for his people, but there are times that you have to take up a sword. You have to take up a shield. You have to take up the word of God. You have to take up prayer. You have to take up warfare and worship, and you have to move Because if you don't move, God can't work through somebody that's just sitting around. There are times you got to go do something. But if you go do something, God will do something. Now, there's a little hidden story that's not really told in the Scripture. But if you think about it, you'll, you'll see this story. While David and his men are here and David is seeking God and the men are, are overcome with grief. Meanwhile... Their captured wives and children are totally at the mercy of the barbaric Amalekites, trussed up like sacks of potatoes and thrown into rough-hewn wagons and prodded with filthy weapons and subjected to the leering mockery of these menacing barbarians. And those wives and those children, they're absolutely terrified by the horrifying fate that no doubt awaits them. You have to remember that these women and these children had never seen David lose a battle. They had always been on the winning side before, but now because the men were away, they'd been left vulnerable and defenseless in the face of the enemy's attack. And there's a story here. I don't know who said it first. Maybe it was a trembling mother with pain in her eyes and panic in her heart. Maybe it was a teenage boy his face flashing fire while his cracking voice betrayed his bluff. Maybe it was a little tiny girl thrown unceremoniously over the shoulder of a massive muscular enemy soldier and his mockery and his cruelty was making her tears flow even faster. I don't know who said it first. I don't know if they wailed it. I don't know if they whispered it. But if you could listen closely In your mind's eye, I think you can hear it. You can almost hear them arguing with the Amalekites. You may be destroying everything we have and everything we've built. You might be winning the battle today. 
You might be holding us captive right now. You might be causing unbelievable grief and unbelievable pain. You might be gloating over all of the destruction and the devastation. But just you wait. Just wait until the men get home. Because when the men get home, this is going to turn around. More than one-third of North American children live in a home where the father is physically absent. Millions more have fathers who are physically present, but emotionally absent. And most tragic of all, millions more have fathers who provide for their children physically and emotionally, but they're totally absent spiritually. I would pause in this series to tell our men, men, we can change that, and we have to change that. When a child leads their family in church involvement, 3.5% of those families end up serving God. When a woman leads her family in church involvement, 17% of those families end up serving God. But when a man leads his family in church involvements, statistics show that 93% of those families end up serving God. Men, we have to pursue, we have to go after it, we have to fight the enemy for our kids, our wives, our grandchildren, our brothers and sisters, brothers in Christ. We need to pursue after the enemy and take back what he has dared to lift his slimy hands and try to mess up. And so I would say to the devil tonight, just wait until the men get home. It changes everything. Men, don't forget that someday somebody else will fill every one of your roles and fulfill every one of your responsibilities that you hold right now. Your work life, uh, your executive life, your career life, all of that will be filled someday by somebody else. Don't forget that your family needs you more than your friends need you. Your family needs you more than your fans need you. Dads, don't trade the one role that is unique to you for something that somebody else will eventually do anyway. Georgia pastor Andy Stanley said this, quote, remember that your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something that you do. It may be someone you raise. Dad, your greatest contribution to end time revival might be six years old right now and you're praying with them and reading them a Bible story. Dad, your greatest contribution to the in gathering that this church will experience might be somebody that's a teenager in your home right now and God has laid his hand on them and they need somebody to fight for them. They don't need a buddy. They need a dad who's a prayer warrior. They need a dad who knows what it is to worship God. They need a dad who knows what it is to be faithful to God's house and faithful to God's word. Devil, I know you're wicked and evil and you cheat and don't play by the rules, but you just wait. There's a bunch of men that are rising up in the last of the last days and they are not going to let their families go to hell and say nothing. They are not going to let their kids be lost and just sit there like a statue. They are praying. They are warring. They are fighting. They are worshiping. Just wait, devil. The men are coming home. I need this church to lift up your hands, male, female, mom and dad. It's time to go to war over our families. It is not time to develop a defeatist mindset. Well, I guess they're just gone. I guess they're not interested. I guess they're just lost. Garbage. Wait until the men get home. Wait until some godly ladies hit their knees in prayer. Oh, lift up your voice and pray. Pursue. Go after it. It's yours. God gave them to you. You don't have to let the devil mess them up and take them down. Yes, sir.
Oh, well, that, no, 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 no. We, we just need to push that one through a little bit. Lift up your voice as you pray. I may be tired, but devil, I'm coming after you. I may be battle sore, but I'm coming after you. I may be weary, but devil, you have not seen the last of me. Mando lo tola bahe yasa, roto ko yabasa. Mando lo kore de siesa. Mendele he rabo yasa. Oh, 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 oh. Mare de la ba Soto la ba yesan de kara bo yasa. Kende he de ba yasa ba ah. Soto la ba yasa. The devil was expecting that. He's not expecting this. Would you stand with me in the house of the Lord? Would you lift up your hands right now? If you're a husband and wife standing together, grab your spouse's hand and lift it with yours. Let's pray over our kids and our families, our homes, our grandkids. Let's pray over our families right now. In the name of Jesus. I don't care how far gone they are. I don't care how messed up they are. I don't care how long they've been backslid. I don't care what kind of sin they're in. Devil, just wait. We're coming. Devil, just wait. We're turning our attention to home. They are not yours. Some of you precious elders, you dedicated your kids to the Lord at this altar or at some altar. They're not the devil's kids. They're God's kids. Devil, they're not yours. You're not having them. Not while I got breath in my body to pray and worship and war and fight and call the name of Jesus. No, 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 no. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You can be seated. In verse 9, the Bible says that David, he went with 600 men and they came to the brook Besor and at that brook they had left behind 200 out of the 600. They were so weary from the battles they'd already been in. They were so faint. They couldn't forge that brook and so they left 200 there and David pursued with 400. Assured by the Lord that his pursuit of the enemy would meet with success David wouldn't stop. Even when one-third of his men were so exhausted they couldn't go, they were too weak, he said, I'll take 400 and do it. I don't need the whole bunch. I just need the people that God's going to lay his hand on. But now they have a problem because where in the world are they going to go? They don't have any idea what direction the Amalekites have gone, and the Lord hasn't yet revealed where their camp is located. But after 10 years spent fleeing from Saul, David knew one thing. He knew how to trust the Lord to order his steps. And sure enough, God came through. They hadn't gone very far before they found an Egyptian slave who'd been abandoned by his Amalekite master three days previously, simply because he'd fallen ill. By now, he should have perished in the terrible heat of the desert wilderness, but the Lord had kept him alive just long enough to give directions to David. So they gave that Egyptian slave some food and water, and after he revived, they put the questions to him. God had arranged it that his master must have been one of the Amalekite leaders, 
because that slave had been there and overheard their plans. He knew exactly where they were headed. His master had abandoned him thinking, counting on, that he was going to die in the desert, but God preserved him because God had another plan. And uh, so David asked him, he said, can you bring me down to the camp of the Amalekites? Can you take me where they are? And uh, in exchange for information, the Egyptian slave makes a deal. He said, if you'll spare my life, and if you won't return me to my cruel Amalekite master, I'll tell you what I know. And once that agreement's in place, he leads them straight to the Amalekite camp. And all those enemy soldiers, with all the plunder they've taken from David's city and from all the other cities they've raided, they are in the middle of one huge drunken celebration. They're gloating over all the spoil and all the prisoners they've taken from Philistine villages, from Israelite villages. But when they attacked Ziklag, They had no idea who they were messing with. David had God on his side, and God's timing is perfect. So David, he launches a surprise attack at twilight, and those Amalekites are so drunk they can't even defend themselves. They fight all through that night, and they fight the next day almost to evening. And that massive Amalekite army is decimated. Only 400 young men out of the entire army escape. And the Bible says that God gave David one incredible victory that day. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. He rescued his two wives. There was nothing lacking to them neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. Somebody say all. all. And David took all the flocks and the herds which they drave before those other cattle and he said, this is David's spoil. God gave David an incredible victory that day. Not only did they get back their wives and children and all their possessions, But they also got all the spoil that the Amalekite army had taken from every other village they had conquered and raided. So when they waded into battle against the enemy, they returned from that battle with far more than they ever had before the battle began. And David said, this is my spoil now. And that's what happens every time the enemy attacks you if you handle it right. Every battle that you win, you gain ground spiritually. So the word from the Lord to David is the same word from the Lord to us. It's pursue. Go after it. Fight the battle. And when you win the battle, you come home with more spoil than you ever dreamed possible. When David and his 400 men returned to the brook Besor, they rejoined that 200 men who were too exhausted to fight with them and to pursue the Amalekites. David greets them, but no sooner has he greeted them than jealousy and resentment and division break out in the ranks. The 400 men say, wait a minute. We fought the battle, so we deserve the spoil. Give them back their wives and their kids, but we should get everything else. We fought. We won. We pursued. They shouldn't share in the credit or in the victory, David. They shouldn't get the reward, David. We should get it all because we did the work. They might be David's men, but right now they're acting like Saul's subjects. And David, he's a different kind of leader than Saul. So he stands up and he said, you are not doing that, brethren, with anything the Lord gave us because you think you fought this battle, but it was God working through you that won this battle. It was God who gave this to us. It was God who preserved us. It was God who delivered the enemy into our hand. Who's going to listen to you? Everybody knows it wasn't you. We had 400 men. They had a massive army. It was not you. And so here's how we're going to deal with this. As his part is that goes down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall receive their part alike. And David decrees that those that fought the enemy should get the same share, the same reward as those who stayed behind to guard the possessions, those that were too tired to fight and to pursue. 
And when he became king, the Bible says in verse 25 that he made that a statute. He made it a law in Israel. Because David understood that there should be evil distribution in the kingdom, even if there was an equal contribution. And it's the same in God's kingdom today. We are privileged, blessed, highly favored by God to belong to a multi-generational church. I love our young people who work and pray and worship and sing and glorify God and reach for their friends and, and do so much around this church. But I would, I would have to say as a pastor that we can't ever get an attitude as the youngest generation of the church that we don't need the oldest generation of the church or that somehow the older generation with their waning strength that they're not contributing as much as they could or should anymore. I'd like to stand here as a pastor and tell you the very same thing that David said. When we baptize a bunch of people next week, the credit doesn't go just to Sunday school or youth department or bus ministry or outreach or certainly the pastors or anything like that. The credit goes, the blessing goes, the reward goes, the excitement goes to this whole church because what you don't understand is that while you might be out uh, teaching a Sunday school class or teaching a Bible study there's some old senior that doesn't have strength anymore to go out and do what you're doing and you might look at them and falsely judge them in church because they don't have the energy to run around the building like some of you young folks do every once in a while but here's what I know they've been praying what we enjoy today into existence for the last 50 plus years years of this church's history. So when we divide the spoil, there's an equal part goes to everybody. There's nobody in this church that's unimportant. There's nobody in this church that's not valued. This spoil goes to everybody. David's totally different than Saul. He puts into law that principle because he wants there to be a unity and a camaraderie and a fellowship in his kingdom. Now the Bible says in addition to giving each of his 600 men a portion of the spoil, when David gets back to Ziklag, he also sends gifts to the elders of every town in southern Judah, every place where he and his men had hidden during the last decade when they were running from Saul. The people in all those towns had helped David escape Saul's cruelty and persecution. And so he felt that the least he could do was bless them for their kindness. So he didn't just give spoil to his 600 men. He gave spoil from the battle to all of these cities and villages that had helped them. Those people had risked the wrath of Saul in helping David. And David didn't know when he did that, that he would very soon be returning to Israel as their king and that his generosity in the present would pay back huge dividends in the future through the favor of those people. Some leaders are very stingy with their ministry. I see it all the time. They jealously guard their perks and their positions. They constantly grasp for the credit and the celebrity and they endlessly and exclusively talk about how God is using them and their gifts and their ministry and their preaching. They have the same horrible blind spot that King Saul had. To them, the kingdom is theirs to lead and to control and to benefit from. They don't understand something that I pray we always understand. Ministry is a team sport. And in God's kingdom, it doesn't matter who gets the recognition as long as our great God gets all the glory. But thank God there are still leaders around with the spirit of David. His men sacrificially served beside him because they knew he wasn't a man after his own reputation. He was a man who was after God's own heart. The very last chapter of 1 Samuel records the very last stand of King Saul against the Philistines. Mount Gilboa is the setting. Saul's army's defeat is recorded in just the first verse. Now the Philistines fought against Israel 
And the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. That's the army's defeat. But then the focus switches to Saul's personal defeat. Without God fighting for them, the Israelite army is no match for the Philistines. Many of Saul's men die on the battlefield. Others desert their posts and flee. See, one of the rules of ancient warfare was always kill the enemy king. Because if you kill the king, that demoralizes the army. So now the Philistines go after Saul and his three sons, Jonathan, Abinadam, and Malchizua. And one after the other, Saul sees his sons brutally killed that day. And then in verse 3, Saul is badly wounded by an archer's arrow. Sore wounded of the archers, the Bible says. And so Saul says to his armor bearer, I want you to draw your sword and I want you to thrust me through. Lest these uncircumcised pagans come and thrust me through and abuse me. Saul knew that like many of the pagan nations in the ancient world, the Philistines were notorious for abusing and humiliating their captives, especially if they were officers and kings. And now with every hope of escape cut off, Saul is afraid that he's going to be tortured to death. So he asks his own armor bearer to kill him. And when that young man could not bring himself to kill his own king, the Bible simply says that Saul took a sword and fell upon it. He committed suicide. And then his armor bearer committed suicide as well. Eventually, the Bible tells us that all of Saul's bodyguards and all the officers that were around him, they met their death at the hands of the Philistines that day. And at that point, when they saw literally the army uh, lose every senior officer, the rest of the army fled in fear. The Bible tells us in verse 7, that they forsook all the towns along the eastern side of the Jordan River. They just left. They ran for their lives. And the Philistines came, and they occupied those Israeli towns. And that day was a humiliating, debilitating defeat for the nation of Israel. Pagan armies always, always humiliated the dead. They always stripped them of anything valuable because the spoil was a big part of the wages for the soldiers. The Philistines, the very next day, they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. And they took Saul's body and they cut off his head and they stripped off his armor and they sent into the land of the Philistines and they paraded Saul's mutilated body throughout all the land on the way back to their cities. The Bible says they put his armor in the house of Ashtaroth. Uh, First Chronicles chapter 10 tells us they took his head and put it in the temple of their god Dagon. And the Bible says that they took his body, mutilated, beheaded body, and they fastened it to the wall of Beit Shan, one of the Philistine cities. It was a real disgrace for a Jew not to receive a proper burial. And it would be scandalous for a Jew for their body after death to be left exposed and decaying. And the Philistines know that. They're just cruel. And they're proudly boasting of their victory over Israel. This is the end of King Saul. This is how he ends up. Because he didn't trust God. He didn't serve God. He didn't obey God. He did his own thing in his own way. Saul's first great victory as king had been delivering Jabesh Gilead from the Ammonites. And so the people of that city, when they hear what the Philistines have done to King Saul, they're horrified to hear about their king's death and humiliation. And the very last verses of 1 Samuel tell us that the men of Jabesh Gilead, those brave men, travel all night long through enemy territory and they fight through and they return with the mutilated bodies of Saul and his sons. And then they burn their corpses with fire because that removes the decayed flesh which couldn't be properly washed and prepared for burial. So they burn their corpses 
And then they reverently take their bones and give them an honorable burial under a tree. And in mourning, they fast seven days. That's the end. Now, you've got to remember that First and Second Samuel were originally one book. So the last chapter of First Samuel leaves a lot of loose threads to tie together. And so to wind up this series, we're going to read just a little bit further. Second Samuel chapter 1 tells us, It came to pass after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had, ob- had abode two days in Ziklag, it came to pass on the third day that a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth on his head. And he came to David and he fell to the earth in front of David. And David has this conversation with this man. Now the Bible's very specific. Two days, third day. There's a reason for that. On the very same day that David and his men were slaughtering the Amalekite army in 1 Samuel 30, on that very same day, Saul and his men were being slaughtered by the Philistine army at Mount Gilboa in 1 Samuel 31. The next day, while David was returning to Ziklag in 1 Samuel 30, the Philistines were desecrating the bodies of Saul and his sons in 1 Samuel 31. But something happened. Just before those Amalekites got to Saul's corpse, just before the Philistines got to Saul's corpse, an Amalekite who happened to be there on the battlefield, he must have got there first. He took Saul's royal crown and his royal armband or bracelet off of his corpse and he set off to find David in Ziklag. His journey on foot took three days. So the Bible says it was on David's third day back in Ziklag that he got this tragic news that Israel had been defeated. And the Amalekite messenger told him about the deaths of Saul, the man he most feared, and the death of Jonathan, the man he most loved. Now that Amalekite had definitely been present on the battlefield because he had Saul's crown and he had Saul's armband. He was obviously there. But almost everything else he told David was a blatant lie. Scripture tells us plainly in two places, 1 Samuel 31.4, 1 Chronicles 10.4, that Saul committed suicide. But this man claims, oh, I was there, and Saul was almost dead. But he was scared of the Philistines, and I stepped up when he was in the throes of death, and in mercy I killed him to save him from being tortured from the Philistines. Total lie. No doubt this Amalekite was just there to steal the loot from the dead. And when he got to Saul's corpse first and saw his crown and his armband, It inspired a devious plan to win David's approval. Everybody in Israel knew that David would undoubtedly now be crowned the next king. And this guy thought, David will richly reward the man who kills Saul. Saul persecuted David for a decade of his life. If I can take this crown and I can take this armband and I can make my way to David and give him this and say, I killed Saul, David is going to favor me. He'll probably give me a position in his kingdom. That Amalekite messenger is certainly not expecting what happens next. Instead of rejoicing at the news, David and all of his men began to weep and wail and mourn and tear their clothes in the Jewish fashion of mourning. They fasted for the rest of the day, mourning and weeping over the death of Saul and the death of Jonathan and lamenting the crushing defeat that Israel had just experienced. You see, while Saul, all through his reign, resented David and treated David as an enemy, David steadfastly refused to treat Saul as his enemy. He always honored Saul as Israel's king, and he even did it in death. And that's why David's standing there on this day with this guy in front of him on the ground saying, here's Saul's crown and here's Saul's armband. Aren't you glad that he's gone? Aren't you glad that he's dead? And by the way, I killed him. That's why David can't even comprehend what that man is saying. And he says to him, how in the world could you be so wicked as to lift your hand 
and lay it on the Lord's anointed king. Now, we don't ever know if David sees through his lie or not. But either way, the man had dishonored Saul. And when he admits that he's an Amalekite, that's the last straw. David immediately orders him to be killed on the spot. And so we come to the end of Saul's reign. How ironic that an Amalekite should be the one to reach down to Saul's corpse and remove the crown of King Saul off his head, and an Amalekite should be the one that would bring that crown to David. It was Saul's refusal to annihilate the Amalekites in the first place that caused God to reject him and to give the kingdom to David. Sadly, in so many areas of his life, what Saul refused to destroy eventually destroyed him. He did it his own way. He did it in his own timing. He did it according to his own preference. He was all about himself. He was all about his ego and his position and his perks and his privileges. And what Saul refused to destroy eventually destroyed him. I wish I could tell you that that only belongs in the Old Testament, that statement, but I would be lying to you because I've seen that happen in the New Testament. I've seen that happen in the lives of people that I know and love, that what they refused to destroy eventually destroyed them. What they refused to get under control eventually got them under its control. What they refused to deal with eventually dealt with them. But I've got good news for you. Centuries later, another Saul would appear on the scene. Saul of Tarsus, who quickly became known as Paul the Apostle. Saul in the New Testament was very different than Saul in the Old Testament. Because the longer that Paul served Jesus, the smaller he became in his own eyes. You can even see the progression in his own words if you read his epistles. The first epistle Paul ever writes is Galatians. And in chapter 1, verse 1, he says, I'm Paul, an apostle. But after a little while of serving Jesus, and after getting the stuffing knocked out of him a few times, and after facing some battles and persecution and people talking about him, and after having a whole lot of junk happen in his life, he introduces himself to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, 9. I'm the least of all the apostles. It's not even proper that you should really call me an apostle because before I get saved, I did wicked things. I persecuted the church of God. And then after a little while longer serving Jesus, he writes to the Ephesians and in 3 verse 8 he says, I'm the least of all the saints. God did all of the good that you ever have seen in my life. Anything that you ever admire in me, all the praises should be given to my Jesus. I'm just the least, less than the least of all the saints. And then to young Timothy, when he's near the end of his life, and he writes to Timothy, in 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, God came into this world to save sinners, and I'm the chief of all sinners. Do you see what happened to Paul? Paul kept getting smaller, and Jesus kept getting bigger in his life. See, that's the goal, folks. With Old Testament Saul, he got bigger and God got squeezed out of his life. He got bigger and all of the people that could have helped him and could have uh, been a benefit and a blessing to him like David, they got pushed to the fringes of his life. They became his enemies because of resentment because Saul just kept getting bigger and bigger in his own mind the longer he lived. But not New Testament Saul, who became Paul the Apostle. The longer Paul walked with Jesus, the smaller Paul got, and the bigger Jesus got. And that is the goal for every person who serves Jesus. That when they look at you, they don't see you and your reputation. They don't see you and your skill set. They don't see you and all of your accomplishments. They don't see you and all of your accolades. But when they look at you, they come away from meeting you, talking about the Jesus that you serve and the Jesus that you worship. Before he died as a martyr, 
this New Testament soul, this New Testament Saul wrote these words to Timothy. I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Timothy, henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, I don't care who else has said bad stuff about me. I don't care who's tried to slander me. I don't care who's tried to persecute me. I've got only one judge. He's the Lord, the righteous judge. And he's gonna give me a crown at that day. But Timothy, it's not just about me. It's not just a reward for me, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Timothy, there's come in a day when every child of God is going to be rewarded. Every child of God is going to be recognized. You're not home yet, Timothy. So just hang in there and wait until that last day. You got to know that one second after he died of suicide at his own hands, the Old Testament Saul wished he could have said, I fought a good fight, but he didn't. I finished my course, but he didn't. I've kept the faith, but he didn't. And so one chapter in Israel's history ends and a new chapter begins and will end here. For the first time in more than 10 years, David and his men are no longer fugitives. And after more than 15 years, 30-year-old David finally reaches the position that 15-year-old David was anointed for. Let me run that by you one more time. After 15 years, 30-year-old David reaches the position that 15-year-old David was anointed for. Now you may read his story in 1 Samuel and you may think, what a waste. All that time in the wilderness, all that time serving Saul who didn't even honor him or love him. You may think that David's time in the wilderness was wasted time. But it was the lessons that God taught David in the wilderness along the way that made him into the leader he eventually became. God placed the character of a king in David's heart long before Israel ever placed the crown of a king on David's head. Years later in the Psalms it is recorded, God chose David also as his servant. He took him from a very humble place from among the sheepfolds, from following the ewes great with young. He brought him to feed Jacob, his people. David was no longer feeding sheep. He was no longer looking after sheep. He was now feeding and looking after God's sheep, God's people Israel, Israel his inheritance. So David fed them according to the integrity of his heart, and he guided them by the skillfulness skillfulness of his hands. Where did he get that integrity? And where did he get that skillfulness that he used for the rest of his life for 40 years to govern Israel? He got that integrity and he got that skill in the wilderness. That's where he got it. David had no idea the day he walked into Ziklag on the worst day of his life that his time of testing was almost over. It certainly looked like God had totally forgotten that David even existed. He'd suffered more than a decade of unjust treatment by Saul. You read it in a few pages in the Bible, but be careful. It represents more than a decade of David's life. It represents a 15-year span from the moment Samuel upends a horn of oil and pours it on David's head and said, God has just called you and anointed you to be Israel's next king. And there's 15 years from that moment till this moment. How easy it would have been for David to justify becoming bitter. How easy it would have been when David's own men turned against him. How easy it would have been that day in Ziklag to throw up his hands and just give up and walk away and say, I'm done, I'm finished, I can't do this anymore. But David always refused to take matters into his own hands. David trusted God's purpose even when he couldn't understand God's process. 
And so the end of our study in 1 Samuel will actually end with a single verse in 2 Samuel. It's an obscure little verse. Seems like it's just a placeholder, a chronological kind of recording, but it's not. 2 Samuel 2 verse 4. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. What David did not know when he walked into Ziklag was that, you listen, was that the worst day of his life was also the best day of his life. Because on that day, the very same day, the dynasty of Saul was finished and the destiny of David was fulfilled. Just one week after David defeated the Amalekites, one week later, he was anointed king of Judah. <laughs> one week. It doesn't take God long to turn something around when he goes to work for his people. The path to the throne detoured David through the wilderness. And God still tests every saint, every leader, every minister of the gospel in the exact same way. Everyone God ever anoints, God tests. And we are such a, a microwave, instant, internet generation. We want everything now. And we even come up with all kinds of justifications. Yeah, but Jesus is coming soon. And what we say when we, when, when we say that, what we mean is, you know, Jesus is coming soon, so he should short circuit the process and he should fast forward us and we should get to detour around all of this and God should use it. But what you don't understand is that just because Jesus is coming soon doesn't mean he's gonna break the rules for our generation. God never gets in a hurry. God always has a process of preparation. And by the way, God's way more interested in what he's doing today in you than what he's doing today through you. God is still fashioning men and women after his own heart because what Saul didn't realize is this isn't your kingdom. This isn't your life. Your life is hid with Christ in God. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit because they're both God's. God's not going to break the rules for this generation. Jesus is coming soon. But he's still going to take us and put us through tests and trials and sometimes months or years of testing and preparation. And so at the end of this series about a young man named David, I want to speak to some young men and women in our church. It's not just to the young men and young women that I speak, but I want to speak especially to them. God calls people. And sometimes he calls a 15-year-old and he doesn't put them in the position he's called them to. And he doesn't give them the gifting that he's promised them until maybe they're 20 or 25 or 30 like David. And you've got to decide forever that I don't care what the process is. I'm going to trust God's purpose. I don't care how long the wilderness gets. I'm going to trust God's way even when his way leads through the wilderness. And that's how God builds a man or a woman, a young person, an adult, a senior, after his own heart. I'd like you to lift up your hands in this sanctuary right now because in a moment we're going to call for a commitment at the end of this series. We've journeyed with Saul. We've journeyed with David. There's a striking difference between the two. There's also a striking difference between people who trust God today and people who try to do it their own way. Would you lift up your voice with your hands right now? And would you begin to pray? There is a call of God, not a call to a position, not a call to a certain authority, but just a call to be made into His image. Just a call to let God's anointing rest on you. Just a call to let God do in you what He has decided to do in you. <laughs> 
Would you stand with pastor? I think that would help us. And when you stand, would you just lift up your hands and would you begin to pray one more time? Speak to somebody tonight. You say, you even said it. This is the worst day of my life. You have even said it. This is the worst season in my life. You've even said it. This is the worst time in my life. What you don't understand about God is that the worst day of your life may simultaneously be the best day of your life. You have no idea what God may be doing behind the scenes in your life, in your family, for your destiny right now. So you got to make up your mind. I'm going to trust him no matter how it feels, no matter how it looks, no matter what I'm going through. You got to make up your mind. I hear some young voices lifted up in prayer. I need some voices that have aged well in the family of God, that have walked through some valleys and river beds and over mountains and through deserts and wilderness. I need some of those seasoned voices to be lifted right now. Idebolo tokoyabasa. Erabotolo shesaba abieka. Erabotola hayasa. Labalotobo shesaba. Epalatalabo yasaba. 